After years of climbing income inequality, the top 1% of Americans officially own a greater share of the country's wealth than the middle class. According to Bloomberg, the total assets owned by the middle 60% of earners dropped to a 26.6% share of the country's wealth, while the 1% have amassed a 27% share. COVID may have been the final straw in reaching this milestone. Last week, Forbes magazine reported that the country's 400 wealthiest people got 40% richer during the pandemic. Team Rising is here to break it all down. Joining us are Nomiki Konst, director at Matriarch and host of The Nomiki Show, and Rachel Bovard, senior director of policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Uh, so, R Rachel, what is the what is the response uh, on on the right to this now that the the middle class has has actually fallen behind by a couple of percentage points of the the one percent in all of its total wealth? I think the right is still trying to unpack a lot of this. You know, a lot of it even goes back, I think, to the election of Donald Trump and and the meaning I think a lot of Republicans and people on the right were trying to find in that. And one of the things I think that they've uncovered is that. You know, many on the right are, are not happy with sort of the structural deficiencies of our current economy. And that's something I think they're trying to grapple with. And you already see a little bit of it starting to snake its way through the Republican Party. You've seen a number of sort of child and family support policies from everyone from Marco Rubio and Mike Lee to Mitt Romney, um, you know, who would start uh, child support policies, you know, from the point of conception. So I do think that they're waking up to a little bit of that, you know, just distortion, I think, from, you know, the rich to the middle class to the poor and trying to, I think, rethink a lot of how they've handled this in the past. You know, Nomiki, it's interesting that the pandemic has exacerbated this uh, this difference because we, you know, we're told we're all in this together, right? We're going to get through this as a, as, a, as a country, as a species. But then some people got through it a lot better than other people, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great that you, you mentioned the pandemic because uh, how many signs and how many memes and how many tweets we saw of people saying, you know, support our frontline workers and our heroes, yet these companies, let's be very real, the reason why the richest 1%, which is those who make over $500,000 a year, 1.3 million Americans in a country of 330 million Americans, the reason why they've been able to do so well is because of two parts, not taxing the wealthy and exploiting workers. We can get into the complexities of systemic issues and and the design of, of, of the Republican experiment uh, and the neoliberal experiment that is at this point mission accomplished. But this was all off of the backs of working people who were literally putting their lives on the lines when we should have been all coming together. So I think this is a this is a critical moment for those in Washington, especially those conservatives who may even think we went too far and may understand that this issue with not having a viable working class is dangerous for national security as well as our own people. Um, this would be the time to, to deal with deeper systemic issues, not just the ones that can solve you know immediate problems, but the deeper systemic issues that were fully designed by those who've been lobbying since the late 70s, the Heritage Foundation, the Koch brothers, et cetera, et cetera, who, by the way, Donald Trump would not be, you know, have, have, have been so strong in the end and not have this support had he not consolidated that group of Republicans who, you know, depend on him essentially for their brands to move forward. Well, and, and Rachel, I, and I think you've talked about this because we might have argued about it on Twitter before. But uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a middle class, if you're a small business owner, you know, you had a horrible time during the pandemic. You possibly had to shut down your business. It was possibly illegal for you to have your business open. But if you're a tech executive, you your product was suddenly indispensable, and uh, you might have come out ahead, or you have very promising prospects. Yeah, I think the role of the pandemic here cannot be overstated in the sense that it really did distort, you know, massively these sectors of the economy. These tech executives, you know, you saw on the graphic became 40 percent wealthier. And a lot of our COVID policies just encouraged that, right, it encouraged people to stay at home to this day, you know, and have things delivered on Amazon, you know, push, you know, uh, on delivery sort of apps forward that really forced the working class to get out there and do those, do that work, right? And and I think not to make a lot of money in the process, but in, incentivize that middle class to keep 
demanding it. So, but I think it even goes beyond that. I mean, a lot of these structural issues existed before the pandemic, and I think the pandemic really exposed them for what they were. But I do think that, you know, we have an, an entire economy where we have a corporate sector that is encouraged or incentivized, you know, to take jobs out of the U.S. to, you know, find the cheapest good possible that can't be made here. And I think the pandemic also exposed you know, those deficiencies that exist in sort of a, you know, on on demand last minute supply chain system that I think also has to be rethought kind of as we come out of this. Political solutions to wealth inequality, however, might not be as clear as they seem. A new YouGov American Compass poll has found that only 28 percent of Americans prefer Biden's expanded child tax credit becoming per- permanent without means testing, suggesting a sharp divide between the D.C. left and the general public. That's at least according to Patrick Brown at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, who also references a new report from conservative think tank, the Institute for Family Studies. The report argues working class parents don't want to dramatically increase or shrink the size of government. They want to improve how it works on, on their behalf to expand the options available to them and help them afford the skyrocketing cost of living. All of this despite the fact that numerous studies have shown the child tax credit has been effective in helping America's poorest families put food on their tables, reducing child hunger by a third. Then you've seen, uh, Nomiki, you've seen Joe, Joe Manchin, for instance, making a big deal about both you know, means testing and, and work requirements on this. What's interesting is that this is this is tax policy. You know, this is being done you know through through the tax code. The the most aggressive effort to do something about the inequality that we've been talking about is this reconciliation package that includes you know three trillion dollars of taxes on the rich redistributed down uh, to the middle class and and to the poor. Yet none of the none of the tax benefits that go to the the super wealthy are ever put on the table for work requirements. In fact, uh, you know, private equity and, and hedge fund executives you know, dodge paying income taxes by saying they're not actually working. They're not workers. You know, they, they, in fact, are just investors who happen, happen to be getting their income from other people's investments. But, they're, but still, it's not work, so they shouldn't be paying uh, actual income taxes on it. Uh, when, when you talk about an inheritance tax, nobody says, well, is this kid going to work? Uh, you know, wh- 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 all of all of the panoply of tax benefits that go to the super wealthy never come with a with a work requirement. Uh, but if you're if you're kicking a few hundred dollars to uh, the middle class, all of a sudden you got to make sure that not only are they uh, raising kids, which is a zone for work, but they're also out in the workforce. What, why? You know, wh- where does that uh, that gap come from? Uh, lobbyists. <laughs> I mean, the, the reality is, is most workers don't have lobbyists. Uh, you know, maybe a union hires a, a you know, a, a decent lobbyist every once in a while to push for something like the PRO Act. But the reality is, is that these corporations, these CEOs spend a lot of money on lobbying people like Joe Manchin, who, you know, it comes, it talks about how much he supports his workers. But if he really supported his workers, he'd look at that last story where it talks about the shrinking middle class that is basically non-existent. And he would recognize that something like an earned income tax credit, child tax credits, anything that supports a, a, especially during a pandemic when so many people were forced to work from home, lost their jobs, weren't able to work at home, were working double hours as Amazon workers, not able to take care of their kids. These are the types of things that keep people out of poverty. And if Joe Manchin and other folks who are pushing this blatantly old and, and, and it doesn't connect to folks, um, means testing, uh, language that's coming from a lobbyist's handbook. That is lobbyist messaging, and I think the American people are seeing through it at this point. I think they're hurting. They want solutions. They want to be able to pay their rent. They want to be able to take care of their kids. They want to be able to get their kids back to school shopping. They want to be able to have a nice Thanksgiving dinner. And suddenly, in 2021, in the richest country in the entire planet, where people are wealthier than they've ever been. Many Americans are faced with not being able to have food on their table yeah. next week. Yeah. Uh, Nomiki and Rachel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Next on Rising, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution's Greg Bluestein will join us for all the latest on Georgia politics. Stick with us for that. <laughs> 